wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You can play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. Let's see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yes, yes, yes. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of Guerrilla Intellectual University. I am Jared Ball. Dr. Joy James is, I believe, in the building and will be joining us audio only. And Kalanji Jamachanga is on the way. Dr. James, you with us this morning? Good morning. As always, or, you know, not always, always, but definitely today. Good to see you and salutations to ancestor George Jackson behind you. Yes, indeed. Right on. Thank you very much. And and, 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 and just to throw this out there as we welcome everybody uh, and good morning to you. We are uh, indeed going to be talking about the first section of Blood in My Eye, George Jackson's Blood in My Eye. Uh, today, Monday, June 5th, though, does mark both the 19th anniversary of my marriage and the death of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> totally unrelated events. <laughs> okay, well, congratulations. <laughs> I want to be careful here. Very but... much for your marriage. <laughs> Totally unrelated events, uh, but we did raise a quick glass during the celebration. And the other connection that I always like to point out to the, today's topic, and uh, uh, Kalanji is overcoming a, 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 a small technical issue. He's on his way. Uh, but one other connection to that day that I like to point out to today and what we're doing today is that our wedding was, was performed by Reverend Earl Neal who was part of George Jackson's external uh, and exterior support network. He presided over George Jackson's funeral service. And uh, um, I believe our wedding was his final professional act before retiring to Southern Africa. So uh, I, I like that entire connection because of course, <laughs> Reagan presided over uh, as governor uh, George Jackson's incarceration while in California as well. So there's a there's a nice little anyway. Just wanted to throw that out there and 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 as we we uh, begin this discussion of uh, blood in my eye, uh, Doctor James. I know Kalanji's on his way. Uh, was there anything or anything that you wanted to raise initially, or or any reflections or thoughts? Uh, uh, as we geared up for this series uh, or anything else? No, I mean, I don't have that impressive bio that you just laid out. Um, but, you know, I'm, I suggest that people Google Earl Neal. I just did. Yeah. And, you know, he was an internationalist and, and you know, he traveled to South Africa. Um, you know, the work that he was doing in the States and also, you know, when you think back in terms of Reagan, I mean, I think of him around the presidency, right? The two terms and his uh, engineering or facilitation of death squads and torturers such as the Contras, right? But also he was governor of California during the time that George Jackson was alive. And, you know, also Reagan sought the death penalty for Angela Davis. And because there was massive support, you know, he couldn't keep like, you know, domino effect as the CIA was doing around the world, but he couldn't do it personally in California, you know, in terms of taking Davis out. Um, we know the histories, of course, of, uh, of Jonathan Jackson and George. And also we, we call out Rochelle McGee, who is still incarcerated in his 80s. Right. And who at Marin County did 
a brilliant and brave maneuver with John and others in order to educate the world about how predatory the police forces are in the United States and how they need to be resisted. But I see our brother Kalanji is on. Good right morning. On. Good morning. Peace. What's happening, good people? What's going on? What's going on? Welcome, welcome. We're just doing some introductory uh, uh, thoughts and comments on the on the series we're embarking on. I am, I've been beyond excited about it. Um, and uh, uh, so anyway. Yeah, I, I think for me, I'm today, um, like you said, being excited about blood in my eyes, an understatement for me, right? So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to... Uh, uh learning and sharing you know i think that's um it's always a good thing when you're talking about george you know so happy to be here right on uh was there any way in particular you all wanted to uh start um i think that uh one of the things we should do and you know forgive me i had some um connection issues, but I'm here now, as you can tell. I think that in order for us to talk about George, it would be nice if we could play a clip of Georgia Jackson. You know, um, just the, I, I think because when we talk about, folks mentioned Mamie Till, and I think that Georgia Jackson should be, uh, her name should be raised in the same breath because you're oh. talking about losing two sons back to back you know um i think that, i'm sorry I'm, I'm over talking go ahead no go ahead i think that's a brilliant you know i mean jared you know started by honoring his marriage you know with his partner and i know there's a lot of discussions about black women's leadership and where they stand and how they support um in partners but also as mothers and daughters you know as daughters you could say erica garner but definitely georgia bia jackson and so she's a namesake of george right a stellar brilliant um evolved over the the time the years and actually that front quote in blood of my eye about i sent you know the the funeral director, whatever, a blank check. John was supposed to be buried alongside of his, the 17 year old, his grandparents, his grandmother and his grandfather. I went to visit the site. I'm paraphrasing, I know, you know, um, you guys are looking at the text right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, just, you know, grass or mowed lawn, but no site, no honor for, the child who is also the soldier, right? And a brilliant tactician. And then she says, blood in my eye. And for <coughs> years, excuse me, I think most people thought it was his father who wrote that, you know, Lester Jackson. But then I, when I was reading it like 20 some odd years ago, I said, I think that's the mother, right? And so there's a way in which the fierceness of mothering and love will also radicalize you into revolutionary struggle that she's the embodiment of it. And, and there were costs to that. I mean, there, you know, there's segments or there's, there's data or writing I've seen to say that the quote respectable, you know, black middle-class or working class would kind of cross the street because she had two revolutionary sons. But, you know, people would cross the street when Ida B. Wells was walking, you know what I'm saying? So that everybody who's on the front line as a lover and a resistor in some ways will be an isolate, but their hearts shine. And that's why we can talk about them today. Absolutely. Right on. Yeah, in that in that Who Killed George Jackson book, um, uh, I forgot, um, Durden Smith, is that the name? Is, uh, he, he attributes that quote to, to the father. And I remember when I read that, I was, I was confused because I always thought it was the mother, but the book doesn't attribute, Blood in My Eye doesn't attribute the quote. So you have to, it's, 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 but I like, I mean, it, yeah. And it always made more sense to me that it would be the mother, given what I thought his relationship was with his father. Um, no, you're right. I mean, so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm coming down with something and I, and I'll keep it brief so we can hear her. Yeah. The father was more ambivalent. I mean, there's a lot to be said about George and his evolving politics around women, right? 
But again, I think that some of the criticisms he had around his mother were the criticisms that we have today around mothers and fathers. It's like they're overly protective. And they were like, well, I would like you to have a long life, so I'm going to discipline you, even though I know this is a corrupt system, to, quote, follow the rules or be deferential or act like you're lesser than, because that will hopefully minimize um, the desire to murder you. But we understand through Tyree Nichols and everything that, no, it doesn't minimize anything, right? So the the way, again, that I see these, these contributions and the attribution or attributing who has agency, who has voice, <clears throat> that her, her son, her older son, understood that she was going through a transformation just as he was. And, and the father, though, I mean, he's, he mourns. Um, there's this brief clip of him be, giving an interview when he says, <coughs> sorry, I'm coming down with something. When he says that, you know, George told us, but we didn't really believe him how, you know, there's, I'm going to call it an assassin ring among prison guards, right? targeting Black men, particularly Black rebels. And, and so the father is mortified. But when you look at his politics, he was less willing to move through those stages to meet his son with the honesty and the fierceness of what the reality is to be hunted in a white nationalist empire. And the mother was just more open to it. And so I would say, no, it wasn't the father, however much he loved you know, his sons. He lost two also but it was the mother who was willing to be transformed. Okay, so what, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go ahead and share some of George's words now, uh, because I think that there are folks who, uh, you know, who've probably never heard of Georgia and some folks who are checking us out who may not even know George at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, some of her words after the assassination of George, which took place one year and two weeks after the assassination of Jonathan, uh, 17 year old Jonathan Jackson. So we'll hear from uh, Georgia Jackson right about now. This was uh, Saturday afternoon, about five minutes after five. And at first I didn't think it was George because it said George Johnson. So I went on with my sewing. And then about three or four minutes later, they said it was George Jackson, one of the so-called Soledad brothers. Now, nobody ever bothered to call me and tell me that he was dead. And it's, um, well, for the past 10 or 11 years, I've expected to hear that he was dead anyway. So although the shock was there from the radio, I still expected to hear it someday, but not from the radio. The son died is fairly well known. Do you believe that? Do you disbelieve that? And do you have any other possibilities? What do you think? Really no, I don't believe that because I don't think my son was mad and I don't think he was an idiot. And I don't think that he would do the things that they said he did. You know, these people have for years gotten away with saying anything that they want to say because they have absolute power over those men. Those men can't even sneeze unless they want them to. They can say anything that they want to say, and we have to take it. You know that. Did they let any of you go in there and find out and talk to the people what happened? You only took their word for what happened, and that's the way it's always been. What do you think of? I think they expected me to go and sit in the corner and cry and not really look at George, but I did. I looked at him. I saw everything that happened to him. He was shot more than once. In fact, his body was mutilated. George was a fine-looking man. But you, you wouldn't have been able to recognize him after they got through with him. It seemed as if they just did things to him for a vengeance, you know. And then when I talked on the phone to him about it at San Quentin, they said everybody was glad he was dead. And you could tell that they were glad for what they did to his body. For free to change whatever you hear into the lies that you see. We have no misconception about how black people are treated in the penal institutions of this country. 
there's a lady that sits beside me who has firsthand knowledge of the way black people are treated in the penal institutions of this country. We are informed that press coverage. I just heard about George's death on the radio. I think that happened. I don't know exactly what happened, but I do know that the guards were out to get him. I know that there was one guard there that treated him very well because he told me this man has kept me alive since they returned me to San Quentin. And I can't, unfortunately, I can't remember his name. She probably saved that guard's life by forgetting his name. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and again, I, I want to point out because, you know, I, I know that folks are like, man, that's that's beautiful that, you know, that um, she stood up for her son. Again, here's a mother who lost two sons, her 17 year old and her 29 year old in literally a year and two weeks. You know, so she didn't even have time to properly mourn her first son. You know, and, and here it is. This takes place. And she talked about how she's sewing. And over the radio, she hears about um, her son being uh, murdered in his prison. And, you know, she went on further during that particular press conference to talk about how when you know, she had never gotten a call from that prison. And when she was trying to reach out to him, they was refusing her calls. Um, and eventually they, uh, someone at the prison said they were glad, you know, that George was dead and no one wanted to talk to her. And she had to pretend to be a reporter at one time to get the warden on the phone. And when she finally got him on the phone, you know, he talked, you know, disrespectful to her, said she didn't, he didn't have anything to say to her. And, you know, basically, you know, hung up on her, you know, so they treated her with with disgust and disdain. And, you know, it's just I mean, I couldn't even imagine hearing that your child was uh, assassinated and, 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 and brutally uh, attacked in his death, his body uh, defiled and the prison never gives any type of, um, you know, I mean, they didn't even tell her nothing about what happened or anything. So, you know, her courage was, you know, I mean, I mean, amazing. You know, I mean, yeah, no doubt. You know, powerful. I that said, though, going back and reviewing this text, I, I fully get it. Of course, that would be their reaction. Of course. I mean, as bad as it is for her and for us. So I just, I, you know, all I want to say, well, not all I want to say, but 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 even dropping my girls off to school today, I, I had this with me. And I was like, it, just reviewing it again all these years later, right. I told them again, I said, if you, I said, one day you have to read this. And if you ever really want to know what I think, if you really, 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 really want to know what I think. This is you have to read this. This is to this day. To it's still for me the most accurate and close uh, uh, explanation of how I see the world and what I think needs to be done. I am not advocating it. I am terrified by it. I just can't get around the accuracy of what I think is the analysis. And and as we go through this, I'm hoping, and I'm being serious here. I'm very much hoping <laughs> that the both of you uh, help me to see where perhaps his analysis does not apply anymore or where areas could have been improved. I, you know, I'm, I'm open to, 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 you know, but I, I can't see it. And it is just as scary today as it was then, but I'm, I'm more convinced of its accuracy because I feel like in, in the 20 plus years since I first read it, I've gotten a little smarter and, and a little more, more aware of the context and, the, and, and, and uh, uh, developed a better understanding of, uh, the sources he refers to and the ideas he's working with. I think too, I mean, I mean, we will actually get to the text, but people have access to it, right? So, you know, thanks for your patience, but just to pay respect to the complexity. I mean, we're killed in prisons on a regular basis. I think, Kalonji, you covered someone 
dies by being eaten by bed bugs. I mean, what 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 century is this, right? But I think what was unique about him is that they feared him. And his his capacity to think, to write, and the courage, right, to be consistent in his analysis. That that showed them, as he said, I will not be counted among the broken men. And in the way you know, however you talk about gender, you know, fine, we'll figure it out. We have a little bit more time. But his understanding, like he's, he's, you know, as the text says, that to see a beautiful Black man is to see someone who has actually dealt with the terror and the psychological fear that's been instilled since, you know, birth and rearing under these conditions of capture, Right. And so I get nervous too when I read it. It's like, because I'm like, well, maybe you're wrong. And then I'm like, mm, I don't think so, right? And so then you have to grapple with the reality. And then what you said about being defiled, it's not just in living, but it's also in death. Because his mother decided both of her sons were going to be buried in Illinois because the cops and the prison guards would visit their grave sites if they were buried in California and routinely destroy, you know, disrespect and, you know, short of digging up the coffins to spit on them and do worse, right? So then this is what we do in this moment. This is what Black Power Media does. We, we preserve what keeps us alive, both, you know, on this physical plane and once we transition. And so George lives not just because of the deeds, not just because of the love and the respect, not just from prison guards, but white supremacists who wouldn't assassinate him because they respected him, right? And he leaves us the text to grapple with. And then, you know, <clears throat> essentially, at least for me, <clears throat> it's a text where we confront our contradictions and our hesitancy. And he was a unique person because once he decided a path, he did not hesitate. I think that, you know, for me, uh, Blood in My Eye, along with Solidar Brothers, should be required reading for any African, um, not just in America, but abroad, not just in the United States. I think that um, Blood in My Eye is a reminder to folks who may have ventured off from the plantation and forgot about, forgotten about the the horrors and tortures of what the United States uh, or what imperialism it what imperialism uh, consists of and contains. And I think that George, for me, George is a natural natural transformation. George is what Malcolm would have been had he gotten the same information. George is what uh, so many others would have been if they understood the depths of this society. Here it is, much like uh, Rochelle McGee, who we cannot help but mention when we talk about George Jackson, seeing he, you know, just a year before he was involved in the Marin County Courthouse situation with Jonathan. And of course, through all this time, 60, damn near 70 years later, he's still locked up. But for me, George, again, you know, his commitment, one of the things that, that, uh, that I'm grateful for is having the opportunity to organize with folks who knew him, having the opportunity to uh, talk to people who came up with him, to get not just because this this is very important this 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 text here, but to just get an understanding of the man because I think that part of the fear that and not, not to speak for you, Jared, but I think part of the fear is knowing, just like knowing that, that someday, you know, we all have to leave this planet. 
revolution is inevitable. And it, it's not fun. It's not a game. And it is intelligent to have some sort of healthy fear because, you know, you know what comes with what 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 comes with war. And I think that this right here, for folks in in the academy in particular, you know, who write about revolution and who capitalize off of the bloodshed of our martyrs, this book should be a curse to them. The spirit of George should haunt them. You know what I mean? You should, this should be something you don't tamper with. For me, George Jackson and Blood in My Eye is like, it is, it is that that African spirituality. When you talk about Shaka Zulu, when you talk about Dedan Kamathi and, and so many others that actually were in the battlefield, the Che Guevara's and so on and so forth, this is putting it into words. You know what I mean? And here it is, you're talking about being in the belly of the beast. You couldn't get no more in the belly of the beast than where he was and the charges he had and still being brave enough to continue to send these letters out and to uh and, and to write so yeah i mean this so so i i hear you and i appreciate what you're saying and i and i and i acknowledge my defensiveness on this but it's not just the academics who need to be afraid oh no doubt no doubt no it's, doubt he's yeah. it's he's talking to because it's the it's the it's the nonprofit industrial complex activists who make <laughs> whose careers probably surpass at this point academics yeah. it's the it's the it's the activists who who as 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 professor james said a minute ago at least as i heard it who it is the it, it is the activists who are challenged beyond their limitations and contradictions all of us you can't read this no matter where you are it's the black bourgeoisie and the black capitalist class who have to be shivering more than as much as anybody uh, when it, when when they hear George and 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 hear those footsteps, uh, and then certainly to what both of you have already raised, it's the state, and that's where the fear for me comes in. I admit it. It's the repressive elements that he talks about. It's 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 the conditions that I I do believe have to we have to suffer if this is going to get corrected. It is the smell of cordite, of 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 death of it is the it is the house to house raids it is watching loved ones carried off i mean that's that's what i fear yeah. that's what i fear uh i fear and then on another level i fear the person that i saw myself becoming in the military that i know i would have to fully embrace at least elements of i don't like that i don't like that I want to I want to leave this show and go chill today. Like, I don't want to have to I don't want what ha what I would know the world would have to be. If because uh, uh, because I do agree with George's uh, conclusions here, the only thing that has ever given me any solace in my or that the only thing that, that continues to give my contradiction solace is when I can lean back on and say the only reason he could reach this level of clarity and and even activity is because he was already locked up. And that had and and with that hope almost that had he not been locked up, he would have been a, a better version of what many of us out here are at best. You know what I mean? In other words, that that's what that's what I mean. And that's also a fear. But did you also you know? yes, think don't you also think, Jared? I mean, you know, where he was held where he was held captive. Was a war zone, yeah. And so when you were talking, I started thinking about Geronimo, and I know <clears throat> both of you have, like, you know, platformed his content or you know interviewed his family members. You know, you've read the memoir, uh, Elmer um, Geronimo G. Jaga Pratt, who had a Purple Heart, I believe, from Vietnam, and then you know brought the skills back and use them to stabilize or attempt to stabilize and protect the movement, meaning the black revolutionary movement until he was betrayed and captured, you know, sentenced to prison, you know, through the FBI 
and the cops, LAPD framed, and then later get some monetary settlement. But like the war zone, we already know it exists. It's just like we're not targeted the way other people are. And so I hear you, I hear what you're saying, and I totally agree with it. But I also, there's another element to it. And sorry if I'm not making myself clear. We already know what he wrote in the book. We just don't want to talk about it, even to ourselves. Like, we already know that, you know, people like the white nationalists roll up and just start shooting up, you know, um, Dylan Roof. Oh, like, welcome to our prayer circle. Come on. Like, we already know that the state, Obama will go to the funeral and he will sing Amazing Grace and weep. And that is a humane gesture. But I'm like, okay, you're also commander in chief. That's a military role. So what's your plan for the white supremacists and the white terrorists? Like, well, we really don't have one. Right. And so this is why we can read him because we know he's telling the truth. Now, how we feel about the truth is another matter. But we're we're not we're not dim-witted and we're not disaffected. And there are people who are compradors or who, I mean, like I said, 20 years ago, I didn't think many people were teaching him in university classrooms. Today, a lot of people seem to be doing it. And these are not people that I I don't get to stamp if oh, stamp of approval. Oh, you're a revolutionary. You're not. But anyway, they're not the people I would recognize as being on the quote front lines or in communities that are the most most likely to be terrorized by police. So there's an attraction that we have to George, and I think some people try to tamp it down like they would for the sister who's offshore. But we already know that he presented an analytical framework that is factual. And to that to that point, you know, the reality is, you know, the book can be digested now. But we know damn well most of these folks that's talking about George wouldn't want to stand nowhere near George. They wouldn't want to be anywhere near Malcolm. And and the proof is in those fighters who exist today, the fact that you still have the Sekou Odingas, the Daruba Ben Wahads, you know, and, and, and so many others, you mentioned the Sada, you know, and so many others who exist right now that, you know, the, the, the Muhammad Ahmeds, the Max Stanfords, you know, these are folks for all practical purposes, you don't find them on every platform because they're, they're a threat due to the, based on their thinking alone. Well, Mia's not locked up for any crime. Don't get it twisted. He's locked up because of the fact that, you know, they fear more Mumias. And if they could silence him, they would. And I'm sure they've attempted to. And, and I'm not just talking about uh, uh, the people who are supposed to be against him. Even some of the folks who are supposed to be on his side have made efforts to silence him. Because keeping it a hundred, as they would say, Mumia is a cash cow to some folks. You understand what I'm saying? Imam Jamil Alameen, H. Rap Brown, was walking around, cleaned up the West End community, you know, created Jamaats all across the, 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 the country. And right now, folks ignore him. His name should ring bells all over the place. The Muslim community, the secular community, the revolutionary community, to a great extent, ignore him. And that's what would have happened with George. You know, but, you know, George is a commodity now for some. But lo and behold, there are some of us who, you know, who fight for George like, you know, like some would fight for their profits. I'll just say that. Yeah, yeah right I on. Oh, I wrote right. something in the chat. I don't know if you want to read it. I do. I, I didn't oh, know. Yes. Okay, I didn't write it. Somebody else wrote it. But you can well, it. well, something. I'll just say it this way then. How about this? Something popped up in the chat that I mm -hmm. that that I would love to have thought to have written. Um, and it, and the the quote is the it says quote This is why freedom dreams don't work. If you read and respect George, he was a war theorist. 
end quote. And that is exactly right. You can't have freedom dreams and deal with George because he was he he was calling for war and he was theorizing war. And that's why when you read Blood in My Eye, it even challenges when people say, uh, and he even speaks to this in the first section and gets builds throughout the book. But but when people say that's just revolutionary s talking you can't there, you know there is no there is no even when dr king was saying there's no value to armed struggle it would just be a complete you know uh uh, uh you know uh, destruction of the community that guerrilla warfare can't work that there's no value to it it has no purpose well you would have to you i think that argument can be made but you got to explain why george is wrong then you have to deal with blood in my eye and page by page and explain why what he says is incorrect because he has an answer for that argument. So again, it's not your, it's, so your, it's, it, that quote is perfect. He was a war theorist. He was a strategist. He was a tactician. He, freedom dreams don't work. No, especially, especially <laughs> when, just... when freedom dreams don't work, especially for someone like George, because he's highlighting America's nightmare. You know what I'm saying? He's highlighting the fact that America is a nightmare for African people, for black people, for colonized uh, and oppressed people, not just home, but abroad. You know, so you can dream all you want to. I mean, shit, King had a dream, but that didn't stop the Lorraine Motel incident. You know what I'm saying? And that's no disrespect to King. I'm just telling you what it is. You know? didn't even stop him from calling it a nightmare himself. He said yeah, right. it was, he was like, I say no. Yeah. Isn't that interesting then that as this point, I want the okay. Our psychological landscape, I know people think that if we talk about psyches and psychological and emotional, we're not really materially engaged in the struggle, but I believe it's more complicated so we can do it and still be materially engaged in the struggle. I think, you know, because King, so for me, yes, King, he was cautious, he was worried, but he was, he also knew that he was going to die on the battlefield. So there's different kind of warriors. Like there's some people who like, I can carry something. Other people like, I can't, but I'll like deflect or I'll be the sacrificial and then hopefully I'll buy you some time. And so I respect King and I believe, you know, King understood the war because he was also an internationalist as George is or was. They're all living ancestors anyway. So, you know, George talks about the communes. King talks about the beloved community. They're both driven by agape, different forms of love. George is willing to pick up, you know, the sickle, the ham like as we, you know, heard, you know, when we were in Texas, like these are farmer implements, but farmer implements are also like um, their material weapons, right? When you have to do more than cut weed, you know, or something, right? And so, I feel that they, even if people want to separate them, they also converge, but with different tactics. So here, this this quote from George, I believe it's like to the preface, not the preface, but the intro. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he says, we cannot withdraw from the cities in order to complete the revolutionary syllogism. The fascists must be forced to withdraw. And under cover of the guns which force their withdrawal, we will build the new black communes. And then there's another quote, all caps, which I won't read in this moment. So his struggle against fascism is why I believe so many people read him beyond the black communities. Because like now the language of fascism, you know, we have to deal with fascism is coming back, but from these sectors that still are aligned with liberalism or radical liberalism, it'll be book banning, you know, or not being able to do critical race theory. That is the expression of fascism. That's like, okay, maybe you're getting closer, but I think it's more than that. Or another one would be um, January 6th, the insurrection, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's like fascist run, trying to, break in and not understanding that they could be shot in the chest too, just like we could. It's just like only one of you, but instead of masses of us, right? Um, or Bernie Sanders talking about he's embarrassed to be Jewish because of Israel and their fascism against Palestinians. The thing that I appreciate and am in awe about George is that he doesn't just put it on the table. He actually says, I have a strategy for fascism. And so then if you don't like his strategy, then you need to come up with a better one. 
And see, this is where it gets a little dicey here because I'm like, well, who's got a better one that I'm reading? It's like, oh, I'm not reading other people. I'm reading George. So he seems to be the most honest. And I call it war resistance. Like I always say, like we were in a war before we fought one. We didn't start this mess. Somebody like took us from one continent, you know, tried to kill us on water and then brought us to another continent to kill us in different ways. So it's like, you know, centuries of ongoing assault and dishonor. And George is, is a light, but there are other lights. It's just that they don't articulate his specific skill. And that is the skill of a military theorist. Right on, exactly. I love it. Uh, and he's also, it's also, um, to that point though, and and I'll just I just have a couple of of, of bullet points that I'll just read through real quick to, because okay. to that point about that that Professor James you're making about you have to come up with a better one if you don't like what George is saying. I want to come up with a better one because I don't like what George is saying, but I can't because he's already pre prefigured. Just in this first section of the book, we haven't even gotten all the way in, into everything yet. He's already prefigured the preface down there, but go ahead. <laughs> but he's already prefigured the colonization, the issue of colonization, the black colony and its relationship to to, to a geopolitical uh, international environment. He's already he's already identified fascism is here. All this it's on its way. We have to stop. We have to vote for Biden to stop fascism. No, it's already here. All that one percent. All the talk of the one percent over the last couple of years, I had forgotten. George is already calling it out. Yes. He's talking about the one percent that have everything. He's talking about the paralysis of electoral politics, and this is exactly why I was advocate. And he says in here, he's he says the only purpose for for, for engaging in electoral politics should be disruption. That is my whole point. Of 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 w w when I'm talking about we need to that's my my softening of his point is the after party argument that I keep making. We're going to form an electoral politics anyway, so let's do it differently and become a disruptive force. The the single is he 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 addresses the 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 the, the problem that we have maybe more than ever at this point of issue making politics as he calls it. We reduce everything to an issue. There's no total need for revolution. We just we we'll deal with this this issue, and then and, and then this hashtag, right. and then this, and then this. Yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. to me, and then and I'll stop here. But but I wrote to me, he he uh, he bridges all of the still existing gaps between the isms. He's out the gate saying this is dedicated to the black communist youth. He's talking about. I'm an African. African culture is important. We have to build to socialism. So all I'm hearing in this is, as he says, settle your quarrels. African-centered, materialist, it don't matter. There's only one way to set up a, a world. There's only one way we're going to get there. And all of you have to be involved. So stop retreating to your, to your sectarian corners and claiming some sort of victory and claiming some sort of, I'm doing the most, I'm doing better than you, I'm doing whatever, you're not. And no, 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 you can't. That's what I like. It's George is the total challenge, as David Johnson called him the total warrior, the, the consummate warrior. He is a consummate challenge to anyone serious about correcting things in this world. He's a, it, 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 anyway, I, I'm gonna stop there. Otherwise, I just keep going. But he's prefigured everything. Yeah. And, and we got, we have to remember again, George never saw 30 years. You know what I mean? So this this analysis in such a short time, he was locked up for what, like 10 years or something like 10 that? 10 years. You know what I mean? 10 years he was, you know, uh, held. And he politicized himself and others and still is as an ancestor. You know, you're talking about a brother who not only studied political education wise, I'm talking about, uh, he studied, um, um, how to heal yourself, health, you know, um, you know, he studied, uh, you know, warfare, taught himself and his, in his cadre 
a bastardized form of martial arts. You know what I mean? You know, built men like you like you quoted Joy a little while ago. I would never be counted amongst the broken men. That's been like from the time I heard that it's always been like the motto. You know what I'm saying? To me, it's like, come if you want to. You can't break me. You understand what I'm saying? This is like, I mean, it was just power. You mentioned the 1%, um, I was about to say George, Jared, um, you know, and I wanted to read this piece here. Um, he talked about revolutionary change means the seizure of all that is held by the 1% and the transference of these holdings into the hands of the remaining 99%. He said, if the 1% are simply displaced by another 1%, revolutionary change is not taking place. A social revolution after the fact of the modern corporate capitalist state can only mean the breakup of that state and a completely new form of economics and culture. Um, he said, as slaves, we understand that ownership and mechanics of distribution must be reversed. Now, you know, he, he talked about this. Basically, he's saying that there's there's no reform here. You know what I mean? And even he, he went on further to talk about how after we win, you know, everything must be smashed. All of all of their machinery, all of their equipment, you know, like like folks like Lenin was talking about, it has to be crushed because there's no time for comfort here. You know, we're not replacing the state with with a with a uh, uh, a, a a black version of it you know what i'm saying we're not going to get caught up in neo-colonialism you know what i mean we're not going to win quote unquote and then have to rely on our same oppressors who we just defeated and end up owing them and being in debt and giving them the opportunity to rebuild and eat off of our our carcasses you know so i mean this guy right here to be so young and we we was just I know Joy just referenced Texas. We was out in Houston about a week ago uh, at a conference with folks like Sekou and Dequi and Matt Myers and 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 several others. And there were some there were some young folks in the audience, some young sisters, uh, early twenties, and you know they they felt they had disagreed with something based on uh, a couple of us were saying that, you know, the movement was dead and that it needed to be resurrected. And they came with all this theory. And the one thing I realized, you know, I've never looked at age as a requirement for wisdom. You know, because sometimes, you know, you can be, an elder, you can be a youth, whatever. And George is one of those examples. But the difference between George and a lot of our people of whatever age group, whatever age bracket, he was hungry enough and he had that drive. He was committed enough to seek knowledge and make it as practical as possible. And, and, and folks must understand he wasn't just sitting in the cell reading and writing and, and and studying. He talked about how there was 20 or more attempts on his life while he was locked up. You know what I mean? The guards hated him. To this day, if you get you get caught participating in Black August activities in the California prison system, you can end up locked up. I mean, I know a few years ago they was locking up the 300 individuals up, uh, putting them in solitary, solitary confinement for even having material on George or Black August. You know, so folks take his writings for granted. And I know some people are like, oh, you know, it's just uh, words. They don't care. And, you know, it's not going to. No, it's not just words. And, and of course, words have power. But this is this is. You know, not not only letters, but it's like a, a diary of an African, a diary of a freedom fighter here in this particular colony. You know, to your point in the preface, Gregory Armstrong describes some of these conditions here. 
uh, and makes the point that Georgia's sentence was extended uh, largely, if not primarily, due to the fact that he's constantly coming in defense of other prisoners. Um, and and to your, so to this point about the fear that he inspired in, among the, the his captors, but in in the when describing the cell, he says the cell was a six by eight cell with no protection from wet weather, deprived of all items with which he might clean himself, forced to eat in the stench and filth caused by his own body wastes, allowed to wash his hands only once every five days, and required to sleep on a stiff canvas mat placed directly on the cold canvas floor. And then, as you mentioned, when he was finally let out of there, the few hours a day or a few hours a week or a few hours a year that he's let out of there, he would have to immediately be concerned that he was going to be attacked by somebody sent on him by the, you know, by the guards um, uh, or by some other rival uh, 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 entity. So so and then when you read this Who Killed George Jackson book to hear about all the undercover efforts, in addition to what the guards were doing that were happening in and out of the prison his, you know, um, so that's why I've only to give myself solace in all this. It's I've only said he was able, he was forced to see the clarity of this society at a in, in a way that most of us are prevented from seeing. And even as he talks about in this introductory, these in these this first section we're covering today, he 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 also prefigures all that the state does through media through the purchase of, of, of false leadership and the mis black misleadership class. Uh, he's, he's talking about all that is done to create the fear that I'm speaking of for myself in, in among many of us. That is th to give us just enough that we don't see the with clarity that, th that he reached what the situation is and that what must be done. And it's, it's tremendous. Anyways, it's, I, is there yeah. possible? Sorry, is it sure possible enough. that it's not that we don't see it? I mean, we see it happening to other people. It's that we don't experience it. And so, what you de you describe, Jared, it it has an impact on the brain. But I would also say, you know, sorry, I'm going academic wonky here for a moment. Epistemology you know, the theory of knowledge, how do you know what you know? And some people say by observation, but even Huey, and he's complicated, I have a critique of him, you know, would say that experience is very important, that if you have to experience material conditions to fully comprehend them. And so this is why I would say academics do gloss over or makeovers, or there's a lot of, you know, ski, you know, not skiing, but you know, skimming off the top in terms of radical theory because they don't experience the conditions. I don't experience the conditions, right? Of being, of having somebody try to murder me and then having to be constantly vigilant about that 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, you know, four weeks a month, 12 months a year, you know, for 10, you know, 10 plus years. And so when we think of John McCain, like the Republican, like I got caught in Vietnam, rightly so, man, you know, you, you're fostering a genocide in another country, but the torture is there and he gets recognized as a prisoner of war. But the culture refuses to recognize George as such, because that would make it very clear that we are not stupid and we understand that the way in which the captives are treated or the ones who get, you know, have these encounters with cops who end up murdering them, that that is a war zone. And so I don't think we're dim witted. I just think that it is difficult for us to commit because we want to be protected, even though we know there is no protection from the state, other than like if you're a comprador, I mean, if you're going to be a Clarence Thomas. They'll definitely put a security team, you know, around you. But I'm I'm not even sure if I have the words of, of how to explain this. The uniqueness of George is that he survived as long as he could, and then he continued to live through tax. And so eight thousand people come out to his funeral, and it's multiracial that their protests not just on the other side of the continent when he's assassinated August 21, 1971, you know, in New York and Attica, their protests, but also black women prisoners 
um, and more than Black women prisoners are protesting in California. So people inside, people outside, like they knew who George was. The problem was that we could not protect him because we didn't have a strategy to deal with, you know, assassinations inside of prisons. We still don't. And I would think, you know, 50 years past the loss or the transition, we, we don't have to be like George. We just have to figure out how to keep rebels and revolutionaries alive. So we're not even asking y'all to go on the on the field, like when, you know, like that's not what you're trained for, don't have the experiential knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. But being able to keep our captives alive and to get them out, I think we could develop our skills on that level. Mm -hmm. we, we All right. No. Come on, can I just say real quick, I'm sorry to cut you off, but just just a quick, just to clarify for something in response to, to what uh, uh, Joy was just saying. On, I'm thinking of on page five. So I don't, I don't think we're dim-witted and I didn't mean to suggest that at all. And and in fact, I, I made a note in the margin uh, uh, here uh, um, on my new copy, because my old copy is is barely, I can barely even open the joint. It'll fall apart from overuse. But but in this copy, thinking about these 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 wonderful backs and forths that I have with, with Brother Diallo sometimes on Friday mornings, but this is the point, and George says it on the, the end of the uh, first full paragraph on page five when he's talking about why he prefers Peking to Atlanta in terms of developing an, an analysis. And he said, but, quote, but it's unfair to automatically condemn a black person for not understanding economic and political subtleties. Some are simply confused in an honest way, end quote. And that's sort of the point that I'm saying, that, 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 I'm, I'm, that I'm meaning to make, that in agreement, as I understand what he's saying, that that so much is done and i don't think we fully even to this day appreciate how much effort and and resources and organization is put by those in power to manufacture our consent as chomsky said and her ed herman said but that's why i also wrote in my note later because he says this brilliantly our job shouldn't be to to certainly to allow the manufacturing of consent we have to manufacture the conditions for revolution and i just bar but anyway, I just want to clarify that that was I, I, I fully hear you and and I agree uh I think with you and and George and why I, I understand why so many of us struggle to to make it. I to thanks for that. Colonji, I know you want to say something, but I just want to clarify with Jared. I appreciate what you just said because it looks like I was focusing on on race and maybe forgetting class, and maybe you were focusing on class and the mystification is about the classism and the purchasing society. I mean, because you do that a lot, right? You like you study economies, right? And buying myths and, and stuff like that. And so I was I was trying to say, well, we understand anti-black terror, but right, we may not fully comprehend capitalism. Okay, right okay. on. Right on. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, you know, when we talk about the conditions and, and we're talking about uh George and war and so on and so forth, we have to remember that it was barely a year before this uh, this this particular text was written from the assassination of four of George's comrades. You're talking about W.L. Nolan, Alvin Juggs Miller, Cleveland Edwards, and Jonathan Jackson. This all took place in 1970. So you have these four particular brothers and you also have um, the prison guard who, you know, was killed in quote unquote retaliation after the um, assassination of W.L. Nolan and, 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 the, and the other brothers. So imagine having to, we already know how these, pigs get down when one of theirs are taken out. You know, when one of their folks are taken out, you know, so now George has to live behind the walls. They know what he's about. They know his teachings. They know what he's studying. They read his letters, you know, so he still has to eat. Imagine what they're doing to his food. You understand? Imagine, imagine, 
how they are interacting with what they would call a quote unquote cop killer inside of the camps. So they're already looking at him like he murdered one of their comrades. So he has to constantly live. So to be brave under those conditions, you're not only just in, in prison, but you're in a situation where you are literally one of the most hated men in America. And to still have that level of bravery and that level of tenacity speaks volumes. And to be so young and to know that you're captured, you know, it's easy for folks to, you know, run around in general population. And when I'm talking about general population, I'm saying like, um, you know, not quote unquote behind bars, but the way we are right now. You know, it's easy to, we, we can talk tough. But when you're literally behind these walls being tortured, um, a few days ago, we had uh, Harold Taylor on when we did the uh, Geronimo piece. And I don't think that folks understood what he was saying. It's like, look, they shot our car up. He got shot six times himself. Tortured with cattle prods. They stuck cattle prods to his testicles and to his um anus and and you know put typewriter bags over their head and and just all types of things folks like uh Sekou or Sundiata you know took their fingernails off with pliers and so on and so forth when we're talking about prison here in the United States and you are a prisoner of prisoner of war or a political prisoner is a whole nother kind of hell you know, they talked about Guantanamo, but Pelican Bay was no better. Angola was no better. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Parchman in Mississippi is no better. There's still brothers and sisters that's being disappeared right now. So, you know, we must always, uh, you know, I don't understand how people that love Malcolm don't appreciate George or can't appreciate George. I mean, it's it's kind of different but you know that's just my thoughts well my first thought to that is that that george doesn't have the promotion you know, network and i don't mean to say this disparagingly of malcolm of course in any way but he doesn't have the promotional support network that malcolm has uh and it's much more difficult to especially again rereading blood in my eye for this th these discussions it is impossible to even more so than Malcolm, to rebrand him posthumously into something acceptable. There could be no, even, even Peniel Joseph in his best writing couldn't write a concluding chapter about George that in any way could have him supporting Barack Obama. I, I, I would still argue that couldn't be done with Malcolm, but, but, but it's even more difficult because George was much more explicit in, in, and with a, a specific clarity uh, uh, and blood in my eye. I may be wrong on this. I don't know. It's, I get, I maybe, maybe I'm projecting or speculating too much, but blood in my eye is far more an honest final document written from the, produced by the author and the subject than is the autobiography of Malcolm X. I, so, I Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I agree with that. I mean, I think before you guys were talking about is it who uh who edited Malcolm's work? Jared, you were talking about it in one um, of your shows. Uh uh Alex Haley, yeah. Alex Haley, yeah. And it, you know, I believe at one point he also reported to the FBI, but this um Malcolm Malcolm was probably more embraceable. You know, he was assassinated in 65, right? He was probably more embraceable because even though he was a revolutionary, even though he's an internationalist, even though, he, you know, he gave the phrase, you know, gifted the phrase by any means necessary, people could still inject levels of abstraction, right, into his narrative and reduce it to a kind of cultural formation, 
And he did originally when he was politicized, when he was incarcerated, I mean, he did connect with the Nation of Islam, right? And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who, you know, obviously had contradictions and that's how they split. George is made um, field marshal, at least this is what uh, Newton says at his funeral, and general. So he gives them the honorific title of general and field marshal, which just says, they, you know, when you think of Malcolm, you think of, of the rhetoric, you need to protect your family. You know, King had guns too, but then by arrest and convinced him, you know, he's got four little kids. He's like, I need my guns. He's like, no, you don't. It's, you know, not that it's going to be okay, but we're going to set a, a model or standard. You know, Malcolm at the same time says, I, I have like four kids too. I'm going to protect my family. And it's like, okay, that's logical and tangible. George is like, I really don't have a biological family to put out like as a photo. You know, it's like, I'm doing the father thing right? Which everybody understands, like the role of the male patriarch is like, protect your family. That's your job, right? Even if you get shot up for it. What I read George is doing is that the family is the political project. And the political project is not just the internal colony within the United States. It is the colonial structure around the globe. So that is such a massive project that who you are as a socialized American would have to die in order for you to be somebody like George. It's it's not like, let's add this revolutionary thing. Let's add the gun, like, you know, Malcolm posing with the, you know, peace, looking through the window, like they're going to firebomb his house anyway. Um, and we have contradictions because we know, you know, his daughters are suing like CIA, FBI, NYPD, but we also know that Black people were involved, of course, in Malcolm's death. So when you get to George, I don't want to say he's an isolate, but he would be one of, I believe in stages. That's when I talk about the Captain Material. You go from caretaking, you know, protest, movement, maronage, war resistance. George was in that, George went to those higher registers. And it's, it's very hard to reach unless you're willing to mutate. And I'm not saying you have to be stuck and tortured in a prison to mutate. You could just be disciplined and, and devoted. But I do want to go back to what Kalandri had said earlier. I think the nature of warfare is the same, but it's also different. So I don't want people to think that we're Luddites, right? But, you know, as in Houston, when the people were talking, when the sister came up and talked about AI, and you think about drone strikes and you think about other things, right? The sophistication of the um, fascist elements within the empire, their sophisticated toolbox is is fairly, you know, they think it's a 360 wrap, but you can always, you know, you can always mess with anything that's structured. But I think <coughs> how we think about war resistance has to change. And the only way that can happen is if we start talking publicly on a regular basis with each other about war resistance. Great. Um, and I, I wanted to circle back to um, what Jared was saying as well. Um, when you when you said, when you was talking about how it was kind of, and I'm paraphrasing, difficult to, um, to tamper with George. Of course, you know, let's not forget they they made efforts. The 2007 film Black August with Gary Dordan, you know, I mean, that was a horrible depiction of George. And they almost got away with it. But it was so trash that, you know, that that most folks forgot it even existed. You know, um I think Speaking that, of forgotten trash that tried to do the same thing, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just want to just want to remind everybody of this monstrosity, this effort oh, yeah. from from Ja Rule and them, where yeah. they tried to look with the cover art and everything, uh, uh, and zero thing. politics. But anyway, sorry about that. Just wanted to what well, we were remembering yeah, monstrosity. You needed you needed some blood in his eye for that one. But anyway, um, no, I mean I, I think that again, man, just uh, you know. And, and and I know folks are like, uh, 
you know, oh, you know, it, because there's always criticism for everyone. You know what I mean? Like you all said earlier, you know, show me what you do. You know, and I'm paraphrasing, but but, you know, bring something to the table. You know, you're talking about someone who there, there was no Internet. You know what I mean? There was no Internet. There was no uh, um, opportunities to go to any library outside of the quote unquote prison library. You know, so he worked. When you talk about a gorilla, that was a gorilla in every sense of the word. When you're talking about uh, a gorilla intellectual. George is a gorilla intellectual of the highest order, you know, because he was hungry enough. He was passionate enough and committed enough to take whatever tools that he had in his existence and utilize them in a way. Again, he went in this joint 18 years old as a petty criminal, quote unquote. You know what I'm saying? This is a man who was sentenced from one year to life for a quote unquote seventy dollar uh, gas station uh, robbery, and he politicized himself in a way in 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 ten years time, less than that, that has us talking about his book right now. This twenty nine year old young man. So listen, I had to. This weekend, I had to dispose a body. I had to dispose of a body this weekend. Today's Monday, right? This weekend. I, I and go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I know, you, right? You, I know, I know, right? Jared, I know, right? I know. I know. Because we're not going to be implicated. Go ahead. Yeah, really. No, no, no. I know, no, no. Did you hear what Jared said? No. Yeah, I yeah, no. <laughs> so if they AI. clip it right here, we might have a problem. Okay. But but two two important facts. One, I didn't create the body. Two, the body was created in my backyard by my dog. Hmm. Uh and and it was left to me to address it. And I'm not going front. It took a few minutes. I was like, "Damn, I got to go out here and look at this mess and clean up this mess." And I honestly was thinking about, you know, all this reading of George recently. And I was like, "This is if you <laughs> You can't read George and not go out in this backyard and handle this business. And it it literally motivated me and got me. So it was just my dog had gotten a, gotten gotten a hold of a little rodent that he thought probably thought was more of a toy than anything, and mm -hmm. and you know just got carried away. But but to overcome my initial like oh man I don't want to have to uh. I was like, but I've really thought about it again. I'm not going front. I, 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 I was sitting and I was like trying to get myself motivated, you know, go get the shovel, go get the, you got, you got to go out here. And I'm like, but, but, but this is, <laughs> this is a very, very, very minor difficulty that would have to be overcome in the process to get to where, where, you know, where things might have to be. But, but, and, and he talks about, <laughs> we have to prepare ourselves to dig graves. And I was like, I got to go out here and prepare myself to dig a grave. But, I, you know, again, all seriousness, all jokes aside, it was just a little rodent. My dog got a hold of just a, just a little joke. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, mm -hmm. it, no, I I'm just it. saying, but I did usually I literally use George to motivate myself. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, with that, people can use George <laughs> for a lot of different things. No shame. Um, but, yeah, we are. The majority of us are frightened by death, you know, because we want longevity and we should have it. We should all have it. But we understand the structures of empire and anti-Black violence, anti-Indigenous lives, you know, all those missing, was it thousands of Indigenous women and, and girls, LGBTQ trans folks being hunted. We, Our rational mind tells us where we are. Our emotional landscape wishes that we were somewhere else and we could like maybe you maybe you have a card and you can call somebody to take care is this is Mario Puzo take care of somebody to come get whatever's in the yard or the horse head out of somebody's bed right but I believe that in our own ways we're committed and we deal with our our um our unease 
by training ourselves to do what is difficult and for us in different ways just triggers us emotionally. I want to read a, a quote from um, George here. I think it's on pages 52 and 53, but also to go back to what Kalandri said about the intellectualism. I believe Freedom Archives has a uh, platform where they posted 99 books. And then at the time of George's death, he had 99 books in his cell. So he was a librarian. And, you know, he was a scholar. He was an avid reader. I mean, all these things we share with him, even if we don't share his other capacities. So <clears throat> here he's talking about fascism, right? And the corporative or the corporate state allows for no genuinely free political opposition. They only allow meaningless gatherings where they can plant more spies than participants. They feel secure in their ability to mold the opinion of a people interested only in wages. However, real revolutionary activity will draw panic-stricken gunfire. Of course, he means from police forces. Or heart attacks, and he means that from us. So what is to be done after a revolution has failed? After our enemies have created a conservative mass society based on meaningless electoral politics, spectator sports, and a 3% annual rise in purchasing power strictly regulated to negate itself with a corresponding rise in the cost of living. What is to be done about an expertly, scientifically calculated, contra-positive mobilization of the entire society? What can we do with the people who have gone through the authoritarian process and come out sick to the core? So that's like, you know, whether or not you go to church or mosque, but that's, you know, when somebody's ringing the bell to come collectively to meditate on the real, despite all the veils that's dropped over it. And so- It's just bars. He's just, yeah, he's like real, he's, he's prophet. I mean, like, look, nobody liked John the Baptist that much. <laughs> But you have to, but he came first, like before you're going to get this one who's going to be like tortured and nailed onto a car. You know, you had to have somebody who came out in the desert and said, I'm going to tell y'all what's real. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, honey and locust time. And so that we can appreciate. We cannot emulate. This is 21st century. We're not going to do what they did in 20th. But we are doing something and what we're doing right now as a meditation is part of that something. I just want to say very quickly, it's in the show description. I put the video mixtape that I worked on with brother Bashi Rose, uh, who did all the visuals for sure. Uh, but I also put in there the original audio mixtape that I made almost 20 years ago now, um, where the purpose was to get activists and others in the area to read excerpts of George Jackson. And it's because of it, you, when, so you get to hear a variety of people reading his work over, I think some pretty dope beats and music. And, and that's why, I mean, well, that, that's not the why, but one of the reasons is he's, his, he was, he, he, he could write his ass off. It was bars. The way, he, the way he put everything was beautiful and, and incredibly inspiring incredibly inspiring so anyway i just want to encourage people <clears throat> enjoy yourselves take a minute and and for an hour or so i should say and Thank enjoy you. yourself and and sorry real quick and a lot of that also comes from the work of the freedom archives a lot mm -hmm. of their the, uh, 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 so people have got to uh, if they aren't already engage that content as well sorry go ahead Kim. no i was i didn't know if you want to play a part of it and i also wanted to quickly juxtapose soledad brother his prison writings from um, Blood in My Eye. And maybe you and Kalonji could talk about why you chose the second book that was published after he was killed or murdered, right? From the first book. And my understanding of the first book, which faced under his, his white Jewish attorney, very progressive, and she was also Huey P. Newton's attorney. She wanted a book that could, quote, help keep him alive. Right. And that she edited it so that he would be more palatable to liberals and had the French um, artist, theorist, playwright Jean Genet write, you know, the preface or the intro to it. 
But blood in my eye, I think, speaks so strongly to us because even though I believe Toni Morrison got Random House to publish it and with an aside that they were going to make a lot of money, so they didn't care if he was a revolutionary because he was a dead revolutionary. There's something that's poetic in Blood in My Eye because it's like, it's sort of the last statement and the last gift and the last loving expression of someone who knows. And again, I'm going back to King, that their death is imminent. Mm. Yeah, Kalanji, I don't know if you, uh, I can, I have an excerpt, but I can pull up a little clip of the, the mixtape if we want the the, the audio piece uh, uh, whenever. But, um, and I don't know, Kalanji, if you want to say anything about the question. Um, for me, I've always thought, Blood in My Eye just spoke more to me. And it was only reading in the last month or so the the book Who Killed George Jackson that it become even more clear. And even coming back and reading it here, it's almost it's already already pretty much laid out in the in the intro from uh, Jean Gannett, I believe is how you pronounce her name. But but uh, um, oh sorry, Jean Genet. Jean Genet, sorry, right, sorry, he, thank he, you for that. That's a um, a queer male. Um, oh really? Yeah, Jean oh, Genet. I'm sorry. Is a is a man, a French intellectual who is incarcerated, and then he um, he suggested the Panthers let him do a fundraising tour to get their political prisoners out, and so Angelo was the French translator for when he was on tour with the with the Oakland Panthers and raising money, but he did that forward, and that's when Foucault and all the French intellectuals were like, oh George Jackson, and I I think that's always a Trojan horse when you know white intellectuals find our black revolutionaries, but yeah. So so thank you for that. And this is just me driving backwards. This is me driving back and myself up, rewind. Sorry about that. And thanks for the clarity. I've been wrong on that for 30 years now. So thank you for that. I've never followed up to be clear. But it, it was only, but only in that who killed George Jackson book and then rereading this now, Jean Genet, it is, is, uh, uh, said in the Who Killed book to have done what you've said to George's dismay uh, and that George explicitly was upset by this and and did not like what Soledad Brothers turned out to be and wanted this specifically to be published as is to be, as you've said, his most clear, final, un, you know, messable uh, uh, book, right? So that, so that, so that, so it clarified for me why I've just always gravitated to this one more. I've, I've, I think I, I haven't, I haven't looked at Soledad maybe more than passingly in at all, uh, uh, since first reading it, however many years ago. It's been this book that I come back to, and it's because of the energy, the clarity, the politics that I didn't get enough of in Soledad, and now I think I see why that it was, it was. The it was it was the part of George extracted that didn't include this and that without this I don't want so that's that anyway that's my quick answer but Kalanji go ahead and then, you know yeah um yeah for me I think it was uh, oh sometimes... no oh I'm sorry I just read the chat sorry. okay <laughs> sorry, so, sometimes it's important to uh, go backwards. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's important to uh, read George backwards, to go from, you know, from, because we're talking about what, blood in my eye, he sent that out, what, six days before his assassination. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is, this is like the last will and testament, right? This is like, I'm going all out, send this out, you know, don't tamper with it. This is the business. Um, there are some jewels in Solidarity Brothers. You know, there there is uh Solidarity Brother. There is um there, there's one particular letter that I usually read around um Black August. And it, it's when he's talking about uh um charging them in reparations in blood. You know what I mean? I, I think that although they try to water it down, 
the gunpowder is still there. Not as much as blood in my eye, but it but it still exists and it's still a threat. You know, so but but yeah, I think that starting backwards for me was was the best bet. And that's why I always tell people if you want to introduce yourself to Jimi Hendrix, you gotta start with band of gypsies and go absolutely. backwards. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So so with that being said, and it, it's funny how we ended up doing this on GIU because initially we were talking about reading Blood in My Eye before Wretched of the Earth. Mm -hmm. But it just so happened we went from Wretched to Blood in My Eye, which to me kind of makes more sense. But yeah, to answer your question, Joy, I think that's kind of, you know, how, how we looked at it. I want to go back to... Well, I don't know if we, um, I mean, I think it's been here for the last 90 minutes. And I know some people find it an abstraction, but I find it to be the real. I want to talk about how George loved us. Like how he loved his mother, how he loved that 17 year old. And even the mother said, don't call, you know, she, what did she say? Georgia, Miss Georgia. Don't call he, him a boy, right? Yeah, right. she said he was a man. I was like, wait, he's 17. I, I mean, she'd be like, if she was saying, it's like, I, what did I just say? Oh, okay, he's a man. And so it's this maturation, right? Whatever you think a man is, a woman, whatever, or non-binary, but it's this maturation to the adult with agency who is here to express their care at the risk of their lives. For me, that's love. And I, and so we're, as you know, Jordan, as you rightly pointed out, I'll just say for myself, you know, I have fears too. So I'm afraid of like certain kind of confrontations, engagement, but I'm like, well, our people keep doing this. So I can't just stand on the sideline. Right. And though there's something that's very inspiring and reassuring when you're loved in that way, but then sometimes you don't even comprehend it. It's like, my parents didn't even love me like that. You know, I say they were going. Like, I'm gonna change the world because you deserve a better world. I, like my parents are, mm -mm, you know, just like follow rules and and try to keep your head down. And so, how do we even grapple with that kind of love that comes from the revolutionaries? And how would we honor it? I'm not saying we have to do what they do. Obviously, you know, I just say I don't. But you know, as ally or comrade, I recognize this love. And, and so how do we parse it? I mean, George is the walking embodiment of love, but since there's so much violence surrounding him, it's like, oh, we don't want that kind of love. But he wasn't directing it at us. He was directing it at our predators. Right. And I, I think that's the problem. I think that, you know, we, we want love without war. And, you know, for me, I always say that we have to fight for peace. You know, when you're dealing with imperialism, when you're dealing with uh, warmongers, it's not enough to just turn the other cheek. You know, I think George was, as, as Fannie Lou Hamer talked about, sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, and he, he delivered it in such a way that scares and shocks the reality out of people no one wants to no no sane person just wants to fight for the sake of fighting and that's not what he was doing no sane person wants to you know like you said just bloodshed and all of that and violence so on and so forth but you know revolution is not a violent act it is intelligent it's either you get this foot off your neck you know what i'm saying you get this knee off off this neck George Floyd, you know, um, by whatever means, or you sit there and, and, and just be a spectator and being spectators hasn't helped us at all. And I think that George is saying, look, okay, boom, they have your knee, they're near your neck. You have a blade on your side, stick the blade in them. You know what I mean? Or die. But we, we love to hear Malcolm talk about by any means necessary, because it sounds like good rap. But most people that follow Malcolm and study Malcolm, they're not really into no binary means necessary. It's not even a thought. 
you know, it's just like, you know, yeah, we love what Malcolm was talking about. We love what Franz Fanon wrote about. We love what George wrote about. But at the end of the day, you know, theory without practice gets us where. So I, as as I know, we're starting to to point to a a, a close for this morning, uh, and I and and with excitement knowing we got several more weeks of this. Um, I th there are a couple of things I wanted to just re highlight for for those, again, admittedly somewhat selfishly in in the circles that I f at least feel like I still re revolve around or reverberate within. Um, and I, I, I really want to encourage as many as we can get to revisit George or visit for the first time George's work and think about where you are on this spectrum of the isms uh, and, and what you, whatever it is, whether it's Afro-pessimism, African-centered uh, 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 African varieties, uh, Afro, uh, Afrocentrism, Marxist-Leninism, Nkrumah Tereism, Cabralism, Communism, so whatever, wherever, anti-colonialism, Pan-Africanism, wherever you are, and accept, at least intellectually, because I'm obviously I'm not doing anything. We're not. I'm not advocating anything. But but accept the intellectual challenge that he's presenting, and ask yourself, you know, as I keep doing, where. Do, where is he wrong and how does this not apply to wherever I find myself on the spectrum? So yes, there's an oversimplification in these early chapter, in these early pages of, uh, of, of what he means by socialism and communism and anti-colonialism and the black colony and why we should not, as he, in, in putting in my own words, why we should not throw away Marx, Lenin, Mao and Fanon as Eurocentric uh, because they are speaking in their own ways back to the African origins that he is himself, George, saying is important to him. He refers to himself as an African and a communist and recognizes, or or I think in doing so, recognizes the, 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 um, the absence of mutual exclusivity there. Like he recognizes that we can do all of these things or at least engage all of these ideas with the, with the, with the goal of having it develop into a consciousness that is truly revolutionary. So, and I just want to, as I put in my little name tag here, I want to, I'm, I'm, this is going to be for this reading, this is my reading of going to become my new sort of version of a mantra that on page 16, when, when, you know, we always talk a lot about, we're encouraged to talk, think a lot about what er Ed Herman and Chomsky said about manufactured consent. And I get what they were talking about is that consent among the rest of us, the public opinion is shaped by those who rule. But George is asking us to consider this question of, of, of vanguard, revolutionary violence, capitulation, electoral politics, when is it right to do whatever? And he's saying that the task of a revolutionary is to make revolution, the word manufacture can be substituted for the word make and the meaning comes through a little better for us. I love, I love how he does this. But then later in that same page on the, in, the, in the next paragraph, he's saying, as long as they can keep giving us the bread and circuses and the entertainment and all of the sports and all of the, the movies we love and all of the music we love and all of the, it, it, as long as it, it will, it will, it will, uh, 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 it will allow for us to do what he's saying we cannot do, which is to dodge our responsibilities. And we cannot give credence to these slogans built around conditions. When is it right to do something? So then he says, conditions will never be altogether right for a broadly based revolutionary war unless the fascists are stricken by an uncharacteristic fit of total madness. Should we wait for something that is not likely to occur at least for decades? The conditions that are not present must be manufactured. So he's saying to us, and I'm thinking of this just in terms of like the after party concept and our new, what, what should be our different approach to electoral politics or even our intellectual work. But our, our goal should be to create the conditions that push us to next levels of, of, of revolutionary struggle, not to accept that the conditions don't exist and to just simply work within them as they are, but to make them, to manufacture those conditions instead of just allowing our consent to be manufactured by those with more power. And I, anyway, it's just yeah, bars to me. So thank you for that. Yeah. I think 
Yeah, it's interesting what you posed. Maybe I don't completely comprehend it, but I don't think we have to manufacture the conditions because I think the conditions already exist. Because, you know, we've gone from a millionaire class to the billionaire class, the concentration of capital, the 20 some year wars in the Middle East under bogus claims of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, you know, that being peddled by George Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and others. You know, we have trained white nationalist terrorists who, and then, you know, if we can't, we didn't get enough skills there, let's go to Ukraine and like, you know, up our game or whatever. I mean, there's already been the declaration through mass shootings, through rhetoric, through the right wing Supreme Court, through every level of the state apparatus known as governance, right? I believe that, <coughs> sorry, Obama thought Hillary was going to win Clinton and so didn't fill a lot of um, positions of judges, maybe up to 100 or 200. And so Trump filled those. So the law was always against us. And this is what I appreciate from George. For him, law is the definition or the equivalent of fascism. And people could say, oh, that's hyperbolic speech. Well, okay. So now if you get it, an abortion, let's go to Texas again. Why not? It's hell. So if you get an abortion, we can throw you on a homicide charge and then you can be in prison for life. But there's a whole faction that's like, well, let's just execute them. So, so much for the right to life. It's just like, no, it's the right to take life. And so I want to read this section um, from George because I don't I don't agree that things in, in 50 years after his death have become more mystified. I believe they've become more clear. I just think that we're looking for a certain kind of hope and that that becomes mysticism in itself. But this is George. How do we raise a new revolutionary consciousness against a system programmed against our old methods? Revolution is against the law. It will not be allowed, not in significant form. That makes the true revolutionary an outlaw and the black revolutionary a, quote, doomed man, end quote, or doomed woman, you could say. As blacks, we must function as a vanguard in any hostilities. We must use a new approach, unite and revolutionize the black central city commune and slowly provide the people with the incentive to fight by allowing them to create programs that will meet all of their social, political, and economic needs. You must fill the vacuums left by the established order. We must push the settlers off our land when they won't cooperate with the new communal life of our system. We must learn from the people. We must learn from the workers, the discipline they are so highly skilled in. In return, we must teach them the benefits of our revolutionary ideals. We must move Blacks to the forefront of a really productive assault on the outside enemy reactionary culture, not only at the production level, but in all significant areas of property relations. And I would just add to that, it would also be all significant areas of emotional relations and psychological relations, right? So there is no revolutionary violence without revolutionary love. So I'm just gonna be redundant, keep coming back to that. And so, could we love ourselves enough to not just read George or just meditate on George, but also re-engineer our capacity to resist war through the, through the text that George left to us as inheritance? So, so thank you for that. I just want to just all of that. I, I just want to clarify w the way I'm reading what he was saying is I don't. I, so I agree with you that the conditions exist already. What I hear him saying is when he's saying to manufacture the conditions, he's talking to those of us who claim to be activists, but who keep saying the, the condition we we agree with you, George, but the conditions of the people, the people having he even says earlier in the in, in the book, he says something to the, you know, we're always being told to, to we can't move ahead of where the people are. And he's saying that is in itself a reactionary counter revolutionary. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. So, so when I'm saying to manufacture the conditions, I'm saying for those of us who think we already understand the clarity that you laid out, he's saying this is the challenge that to me is so difficult from with George. He's saying to you, you, you Jared, you already know what it is. Now, how are you going to create the conditions among those with yourself and with those you work 
to get to get you all to act on what you already know. Now, where I do think we slightly disagree is in that I do think the, the problems have intensified, but they are more mystified. I this is I because even to the to the to the to the the point of that that beautiful quote that descended upon us in the chat earlier, all of the work to rebrand all of these histories is is happening at a at, with a degree of pervasiveness and sophistication that I think is 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 a real problem and does make it harder for us to do that manufacturing of the conditions that he's telling us need to happen. Uh, so for for every George Floyd and every event that is dragged through the mass media and every event we may know and every reality we know, know to be true, we are getting ever more sophisticated and well-produced material telling us that, yeah, this is a problem, but here's your simple solution. Just you know, uh, vote for Hillary next time or vote for Biden or, you know, or, or, or ignore George or don't know of George. Don't include George in your consideration of, of uh, how to develop a response. And that's, so that's, but anyway. No, but I, I understand, I agree with what you just said, but then there's a part of me that I'm, I'm not sure I fully agree, but it, there's, there's an analogy to it, or maybe that's the word, not the right word, but like, the CIA putting the the uh, statue of Harriet Tubman in their quad. And like I say, the CIA captured Harriet Tubman, cemented her in the quad. Do we have the capacity to rescue her? Like free Harriet Tubman, right? Because along that, they, they've taken our whole narrative and say, hey, she's a spy, we're spies, we're good, right? It's like, no, you're not. Like you killed Patrice Lumumba. I mean, let's go down the list here. So you're not for black freedom. You are the assassin against black freedom, but you want to capture our narratives and put your brand on it. And then there are people who are less lethal who are doing the same thing, like make it some kind of radical liberalism. I think that we don't have, we don't confront them. Do you, do right. you see what I'm saying? I mean, that's why they get away with this. I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to like, Oh, don't swear. Like this is how they get away with these plays because we don't, call them out because we still want, I mean, I think we're afraid of them or they've monetized black death. So, you know, the nonprofits are like, you know, you know, here's a 200,000 for you and 250 for you, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are people who will still call it out if they're in those circles, but most people will not. Right. And, know, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, but I think this becomes a class issue. Like, yes. because, you know, so the people who wage these movements, like when we were talking to Stevie Wilson, again, he's in the same prison that Mumi is in. They're not allowed to talk. I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, like a phone in thing. Right. And we, and he was, you know, reading In Pursuit of Revolutionary Love and asking questions. So he talked about how some of the nonprofits would do what he called symbolic acts at the same time that they were trying to organize strikes. And so they deflected the media. They took the attention away from the strikes, like in Alabama. They took away the protection. And he said, we want out. We're not trying to, like, modify this or reform this. We want our freedom. And we want out. And so they they went on and they did the strike. And it, it really had an impact on the bureaucracy of the predatory zone known as prison. But it didn't have the support of the nonprofits who claim to exist for the incarcerated. And so I just believe we should be really clear about what betrayal is without like doing a scarlet letter on folks, but just like, you know, if you make this play, you understand that you're using those who are captive to leverage something that deepens their captivity which means you should just get off the field because I don't know you, what team are you playing for. You, you know, for to and 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 I'm I'm thinking you said something a few minutes ago, Joy. You said free Harriet, and I, I'm just reflecting on um, thinking back on, you know, you had all these folks that were a few years ago going crazy to take down these statues of these racists in different states. You know, they climbed up. I mean, folks pulled the statues down, so on and so forth. But they literally 
took one of our liberators, placed it in the middle of their shit, and folks didn't even, I mean, you hardly heard about it. You know I, what I'm saying? No, so that, sorry, go they, ahead. They, they will capture you dead or alive. They will capture you, your image. They will capture your, your, your spirit and your being and commodify. And we sit back and, you know, because <laughs> I guess they're the CIA, then, you know, they could put whoever they want to. They could put a statue of your mother out there if they want to. And you're not even going to cry about it because they'll just say, look, well, your mother was a black woman and she was in the struggle and we struggled to build this country and they'll flip the whole shit on you. And, and, and no one has anything to say about it. I mean, so, for yeah. me, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I was like, I didn't even make the connection because I remember all the brave people like climbing these statues and like roping themselves to it. And right. we're going to take on the Confederacy, right? right? And then I was like, well, this, what, what's the CIA in this play? And they're like, oh, no, that's the North. Well, what, like Malcolm, no, it's up South, right? And so what would it mean? Like the CIA is when, you know, they ran these commercials, like here's some black lesbians, we're recruiting them, they love us. Or here's like a Latina who's neurodiverse. She's going to work for us too. It's kind of this whole multicultural, multiracial, everybody can work for empire. And it doesn't matter how much bloodletting and loss that we inflict, Af you know, AFRICOM across the globe, because you can be a player. And also, you know, basically people are afraid of the CIA and they're they're more afraid of the CIA than they're afraid of the Confederates. But the CIA has its liberal wing. And I think this goes back to what Jared says. That's the capture. That's the mystification. And that and this is why we appreciate George. You know, they couldn't capture him. I mean, physically he was in prison. But they couldn't capture his mind, his ideas, his loyalty, and so they had to kill him. Yeah, right on. Yeah, I want to say for for the for the viewers, um, you know, listen, I I was going through some YouTube platforms and channels yesterday, and I have to say that there's nothing like Black Power Media. And I'm not saying this. I, I'm sorry. I know this is a, a side, a little sidebar, and it might sound <laughs> like some type of plug, but it's not a plug. I mean, because, you know, for many of us, we had to go find these people to study from in real life before there was any type of internet. You know what I mean? So the fact that you can come to this platform and you can learn about all types of individuals. We have all types of freedom fighters. And on top of that, sometimes we even have folks on here that we don't necessarily dig. You know what I'm saying? But we give them the opportunity to state their case and to make their claim. You know, I think that you all, you know, we, we're requesting that if you can't do anything else, and, and it doesn't even have to be about a monetary donation or any of that type of stuff, please share our platform. I mean, you have right now live Guerrilla Intellectual University. You have Dr. Joy James, Dr. Jared Ball, and you got this little ranting, raving lunatic named Kalanji in your house or in your on your device. 8 a.m. on a Monday. There's not a school that you can go to. There's not a professor out there that's going to teach you all of the revolutionary teachings and, and um, you know, uh, historical uh, uh, f facts and lessons, so on and so forth, analysis, it, it doesn't exist. So, you know, if you all don't mind, please share, please subscribe, please like. And I know that sounds some kind of way, but hey, man, listen, <laughs> work with us. We're trying to work with you. I co-sign ditto. Me too. Once again, it's all there on the screen. Like, share, subscribe, blackpowermedia.org. Find a way to, 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 I agree. There's nothing like what we're doing out there. And uh, so, yeah. Um, it's like Rogaine. So, I'm not the client, I'm president. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, I know we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, at, at uh, um, when we do rap, we're going to, we're going to close uh, playing some of that mixtape uh, from, from that I was talking about earlier. And, uh, uh, but, and then we're going to pick back up next week with the next section. 
the the schedule is on the uh, the graphic behind us, uh, the the thumbnail. Uh, but you will, you know. But if you like, if you if you are uh, if you have the bell rung for your notifications, you won't miss anything, including when we come back next week on GIU for the next section of Blood in My Eye. Uh, Professor James, any anything else you wanted to, to say before we wrap yeah. up for this morning? Yeah, go ahead. I want to say, yeah, for me, there, like I said, these different levels I, I see us progress through, right? Um, so we can deal with whatever mess is in the backyard. I would say that you people can find at least one other person to subscribe. I mean, this has to be preserved and protected. And if you can read George, you could see that he advocated so many different formations that would keep us alive, intellectually, emotionally, physically, but with a purpose and with a certain kind of devotion that would also require sacrifice. So the least you could do is bug a family member or a friend and say, you need to subscribe and I will subscribe too. And in that way, we strengthen our defenses, you know, even as we debate things out to try to better understand our reality and how to resist warfare. Right on. No, I agree with that wholeheartedly. That's that's what each one teach one is all about. We don't know how long we're going to be here, this platform, because, you know, we're not stepping on toes. We're cutting our feet, you know, so, <laughs> you know, so, uh, man, you know, get with the program. down. Okay. That imagery, uh, we have to talk. <laughs> hey, man, it's Guerrilla Intellectual University. Guerrilla Intellectual, with the, yeah, right you know, on. The motor words are NWA. If it ain't rough, it ain't me. But anyway, go ahead. What was he saying? No, no I, I just want to thank both of you, uh, Professor James, Professor Changa, and and uh, those who will see and hear this, uh, who are here with us live, thank you for joining us. Those who will see and hear this later, appreciate you as well. The links to this and more uh, and, and more are in the show description. So uh, we're going to ride out with, with George and we'll be back next week with more Blood in My Eye and uh, Black Power Media on G uh, GIU on Black Power Media. Tune in. We have a lot coming up today and tomorrow. Right on. Yes, indeed. Make sure you get the bell rung so you don't miss anything. I'm going to keep saying that. And I really like Professor James' suggestion. Let's go out and get at least one other person to subscribe today. Right on. All right. So... Pull this up here. See you all next week. Now, long live the dragon indeed. Black August, George Jackson, special edition, FM6. For all you mixtape cats, if I put some echo on it, you going to listen? In 1960, at the age of 18, George Jackson was accused of stealing $70 from a gas station near Los Angeles. Though there was evidence of his innocence, his court-appointed lawyer maintained that because Jackson had a record, two instances of petty crime, he should plead guilty in exchange for a light sentence in the county jail. He did, and instead received an indeterminate sentence of one year to life. Slavery is something that is being practiced by the system under the color of law. Slavery 400 years ago, slavery today. It's the same, but with a new name. They're making millions and millions of dollars off of enslaving blacks, poor whites, and others daily. People who don't even know that they are being railroaded. Revolution is illegal. It's against the law. It's prohibited. It will not be allowed. It is clear that the revolutionary is a lawless man. The outlaw in the lumpen will make the revolution. The people, the workers, will adopt it. This must be the new order of things after the fact of the modern industrial fascist state. George Jackson, 1971. I've been hungry too long. I've gotten angry too often. I've been lied to and insulted too many times. They pushed me over the line. There can be no retreat. If I leave you a line, I'll leave nothing behind. They'll never count me among the broken men. The first struggle is one waged within our own minds.
we must in all haste transcend the intellectual inhibitions that preclude support of at least the minimum level of violence that must develop concomitantly with each political thrust. Our attitudes must change before we can expect any response from the people, workers, students, lump and proletariat. We must accept the eventuality of bringing the USA to its knees, accept the closing off of critical sections of the city with barbed wire, armored pig carriers crisscrossing the city streets, soldiers everywhere, Tommy guns pointed at stomach level, smoke curling black against the daylight sky, the smell of cordite, house to house searches, doors being kicked down, the commonness of death. Then we must learn the forms of resistance, the booby trap, the silenced pistol and rifle, the pitting of streets to slow them down, the wrecking of heavy equipment to block their efficient movement, false walls, hidden sub-basements, tunnels, Vietnamese style, destruction of the critical elements of the facilities that support establishment order. We must learn the value of infiltration. It works better for us than it does for the opposition. We simply must stop allowing ourselves to be hunted and do some stalking of our own. Their secret police aren't really too secret at all. Right now, we can go numbering, naming, compiling information on them all. They're all too visible to be safe. Revolution is aggressive. Just where are we? Where is this country skidding to? In the morning, the fight will have begun. George Jackson, 1971. Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee. The cry is always the same. We want to be free. Freedom to say the freedom to freedom. It's a hard and lonely road. The only goal be is free to be free. The remedy. What's the remedy mean to be free? The feeling of a revolution. Give it a gas burst. Or the ex con with the hell in his first breath. Be like the baby that survived with a spare breath. Like the soul of a sin and the begs for deafness. Freedom is the feeling that I get when I speak this. Outside of the mere political crisis. Strength in a day, man. Battle was free. It came true. Raise the fist for my beast to witness. I'm free like the labor that's provided in sweatshops. Africans and immigrants with government imports. Incarceration is raised in a plantation. Either locked up or freed on probation. It's double consciousness. Five freedom, five freedom. If the truth sets you free, give you five freedom. Think of the outcome. Seven shots ripping through the chest of Malcolm. And we see you all out. I want to be free to live. Thank you.